Western civilization, how much do you know? My name is Russell Miles and this is the 31st episode of our Western Civilization series. Now I'm a great fan of the English stand-up comic Mark Steele, particularly his Englishmen Who Changed History series. So I thought I'd like to do one myself. I'm calling it Two Scots Who Changed History, subtitled The Battle of Britain. The Battle of Britain would have to be one of the most famous in Western history. We can readily recite Winston Churchill's line, never in the field of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. Small boys whose grandfathers weren't even born can describe the relative merits of Spitfire and Mrs. Schmidt fighters. Even Doctor Who and the Daleks have had a cameo performance in this famous aerial battle. So why was it that the two British commanders, Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Downing and Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Park, received such little official recognition? Hugh Downing was pushed into retirement soon after the battle, and while Keith Park was assigned a series of important commands, after the war, the height of his accomplishment was Alderman of Auckland City Council. To get some perspective of this lack of recognition, we might consider the lot of some British commanders who actually lost their battles. Sir Henry Clinton, he led the British forces against the American Revolutionists. He was made Governor General of Gibraltar. Sir John French was the initial commander of the British Army in France during the Great War. He was replaced in 1915 after a series of costly failures and made Vice Count and Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Lord Gort led the British Expeditionary Forces in France in 1940. He too ended up as Governor General of Gibraltar. What is it with Gibraltar? Is it some sort of vice regal naughty corner? Go and stand in Gibraltar until you're prepared to apologise for losing France. Hugh Downing and Keith Park were both of Scottish background. The Downings moved to England during young Hugh's childhood. Keith Downing was born in New Zealand where his geologist father had migrated. Hugh Downing sought a military career. Now it should be noted that this was less than a generation since the British Army had abolished the peculiar practice of officers purchasing their rank. What would happen if the enemy brought up all your captains and colonels? Even without the purchase system, officers, especially those in a prestigious regiment such as the Coldstream Guards, required independent means to maintain a lifestyle of fine dining, balls and fox hunting. The exception was the engineers and the artillery, who had to graduate from the Royal Military Academy at Walbridge. Prudently, bridges should stand up and shelves land somewhere in the proximity of the enemy. That Hugh Downing went to Walbridge indicates that he was bright, but not necessarily well connected. On graduation, he joined the Royal Garrison Artillery, which manned coastal defence batteries. These large guns required accurate spotting and ranging, and gunners had to wear canvas boot covers, lest the hobnail cause a spark and detonate the explosives which they handled. It can be seen that too much sherry in the afternoon might have disastrous consequences. Hugh Downing later served in Geelong, Gibraltar and Hong Kong, and then for six years with a mountain battery on the Indian frontier. He also attended Army Staff College. In 1912, he returned to Britain where he took up flying lessons. Flying was a marvellous innovation of the time. It would also have been a professional interest as the artillery was focused on the commanding heights for observation. Hugh Downing then transferred to the newly created Royal Flying Corps. He was only a captain after a decade of service, so would likely have seen flying as both an adventure and an opportunity for advancement. In August 1914, the Great War commenced. Hugh Downing held a variety of posts in the rapidly expanding Flying Corps until he was sent to France in command of a squadron in July 1915. Keith Parks took a different path towards a military career. He left school at 16, hardly unusual for the time. He knocked about at what work took his interest and was noted for his keenness of horse riding and for the outdoors. He also served with a local militia in an artillery battery. At 19, Keith Parks went to sea in a local steamship, but when the Great War broke out, he rejoined his militia unit and was sent to Egypt. Keith Parks participated in the landing at Gallipoli where he was commissioned in the field. It was around this time that he transferred to the British Army. This makes sense if he was seeing the military as a career, as there were far more prospects than in a smaller New Zealand army. After Gallipoli, he was sent to France and served in the Battle of the Somme. There he saw aircraft spotting for the artillery. On the 21st of October 1916, he was wounded in an artillery barrage and was evacuated to England. After recuperating, he joined the Royal Flying Corps. 
Hugh Downing continued to serve in France through the Battle of the Somme. However, in late 1916, he was sent back to Britain. One suggestion was that Hugh Downing had clashed with the head of the Royal Flying Corps, General Hugh Trenkard, over the issue of rest for pilots. However, he had been commanding a frontline unit for over a year. The Army was beginning to realise that soldiers had a finite life in active service. In the Second World War, they even calculated that if a soldier was not killed or maimed after 300 days of active service, they would most certainly become mad. Airmen had a far shorter effective life, merely 90 days. In the Great War, few airmen survived even that long. It was likely that Hugh Downing was sent home out of compassion. He was also one of the few officers with staff training and broad experience, so valuable to the growing Flying Corps. He served in a series of senior staff posts in England and was promoted to Brigadier General. With the formation of the Royal Air Force, he became one of its senior commanders. He was regarded as obstinate and uncooperative. He also earned the nickname Sir Stuffy. Sir Stuffy does have a ring to it, just wouldn't say it to his face. Our next podcast will cover the interwar planning and the lead up to the Battle of Britain. If you like this channel, please subscribe and tick like. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I can be contacted at email russmills at iprimus.com.au.